Bitcoin DeFi, auch BTC Fi genannt, kommt eines Tages auf ein Total Value Lock von 250 Milliarden US-Dollar. Zum Vergleich, Ethereum ist aktuell bei 50 Milliarden, die Zahl ist also gewaltig. Das zumindest sagt der Persistence One COO Jerome DeWelter, den wir heute zu Gast haben im Experts Podcast. Ein Hinweis, Jerome spricht kein Deutsch, daher haben wir diesen Podcast auf Englisch aufgenommen, auf unserem YouTube-Channel. Könnt ihr den Podcast aber auch hören und dabei Untertitel laufen lassen und damit wechseln wir auf Englisch. Alright, before we begin, let me quickly introduce my guest, Jerome DeVelta. He is the CEO of Persistence One, a second layer solutions provider, formerly working on Cosmos and now focusing entirely on Bitcoin second layer solutions and BTC Phi. Before that, he was uh, pursuing a career in finance and consulting and lived in cities such as Singapore and Paris. Now he is a tech entrepreneur aiming to scale BTC. Welcome to BTC Echo, Jerome. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm sorry, my, my German is not good enough to do this podcast. Ich kann ein klein bisschen Deutsch reden, uh, aber uh, this is where it ends pretty much. Um, but uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to, uh, to be here. Uh, excited to talk about BTC Phi. Um, and uh, any of the questions you might uh, might have around that, and ex uh, yeah, excited to talk about persistence as well. What we're doing uh, on the BTC Phi uh, ecos ecosystem. Sweet. Let's dive right in. The persistence team focused formerly on liquid staking on Cosmos, and now you are building on Bitcoin. And I was wondering, why did you change your focus there? Yeah, that's, I mean, a great question to start with, I think. I mean, with, with the team we've been building for, for many years now, we're actually, um, tomorrow, I think we've been working for five years. Uh, so day to day started 1st of November. Um, so yeah, five years. Um, I actually joined a little bit later. But um, anyway, five years and, and initially uh, started off as a, as a Cosmos ecosystem project. Uh, back in the day, Cosmos ecosystem was, um, was great and was flourishing. I mean, Uh, it was a good choice for us uh, also uh, because of the tech we actually chose cosmos for the tech uh, around interoperability what we wanted to do back then um, was very originally around real world assets but um, didn't really um, work out because we were too early <laughs> with real world assets um, that was like five years ago uh, it was not a thing uh, so we were actually too early and we realized that and um, with cosmos we were quite closely involved with proof of stake we actually as part of our infrastructure arm Uh, we ran validators for the Cosmos Hub. So we actually launched the Cosmos Hub as one of the main validators to start off with and got a lot of experience on the proof of stake side. Um, became quite well known with everything that was staking. And as a um, as a part of that kind of was very early into liquid staking as well. So uh, we were one of the very first um, to, to look into liquid staking in detail. We actually were the first to launch liquid staking on the Cosmos side. It was just like launched on the Ethereum side uh, slightly before that. Um, but yeah, we focused on that. Uh, we wanted to do liquid staking because the belief was and, and maybe still is that eventually uh, normal assets are not as efficient and we want to create capital efficiency. So if you use liquid staked assets, which continue to generate yields, uh, that would be a more efficient form of, of DeFi in general, so more capital efficient. So we focused on liquid staking, DeFi, um, on liquid staking incubated a, a few projects actually on top of the chain. So Persistence was the chain. Had a, a sister project that kind of launched uh, out of that, uh, which did uh, liquid staking for uh, for Cosmos assets, but they also went went broader than that. Um, and um, yeah, with that we also launched a, a Dex. Um, we had a borrowing lending marketplace that was in the launch, um, but realized over time. Well, I mean, I think we did relatively well. We were one of the biggest Cosmos chains. Uh, we've we've been there from the beginning. Um, realized that within Cosmos, um, the liquidity and the users are not naturally there. It's quite of a, a struggle to attract users. And we were building great products, um, but there were not enough users. So it's a bit of a, a waste of talent, I would say. Um, and we started to really think again, like earlier this year, where can we take our, our talent elsewhere um, to, to make sure that the products that we build actually have great impact. And a lot of people in the team are kind of Bitcoiners at heart and realized, look, If we want to build for the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years, because we all have very long-term visions, which ecosystem would you want to build in? Um, and then we kind of naturally all kind of came to Bitcoin and said, 
actually let's use what we have let's use what we the skills we've built when it comes to interoperability when it comes to operating a deck so know how trading works uh, things like that let's build for bitcoin and uh, especially with the evolving landscape on the bitcoin side um so bitcoin has been evolving quite rapidly over the last few uh, few two years actually uh, initially it's been very slow it's always been that kind of store of value type of asset and, and chain even right like nothing more than that you can transfer bitcoin you can store bitcoin but that's kind of it but in the last two years btc has kind of become more than that people want to build on top of it and then with the, especially with the taproot upgrade uh, more and more things have become possible on the technical side right um, and we've seen a lot of like bitcoin layer twos coming up who are trying to enhance scalability and programmability of the of the bitcoin network and that's where we see a similar issue that what we've seen on the Cosmos side. So on the Cosmos side, there's a lot of different chains, different networks who are all trying to build their own ecosystem and liquidity and users are quite fragmented. Um, and with that, we realized, look, if Bitcoin is not going to do anything about this, we're going to have a fragmented ecosystem of Bitcoin layer twos. And that's where we dove in basically and said, look, we want to we want to build interoperability within Bitcoin and really focus on the different Bitcoin layer twos that are uh, coming up and making them very interoperable in a way. Um, and how we do that, I can dive into that later. I'll just pause here for <laughs> for any questions. I know it's a lot of info to start off with. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, when I talk to Bitcoiners, they are notoriously hard to convince that we even need development onto Bitcoin. They are mostly on the side of digital gold and um, ossification of the Bitcoin core um, code. So what would be your pitch to convince Bitcoiners why BTC even needs DeFi on top of it? Um, I mean, my, my main reason is like it's efficiency, it's capital efficiency in a way. Like you have this asset, which is in a way not productive, you know, like you have uh, more than a trillion dollars worth of, of Bitcoin, right? And currently only 1% of that or one and a bit is actually used in DeFi to try and make it a productive asset. Gold is not a productive asset either. Like you just hold it and you hope it increases in value. Um, but typically in finance, most people would prefer to have productive assets in a way. If you look at the top 10 assets in the world right now, I think Bitcoin is, is listed at number 10, uh, but all of the others are like companies, and except for I think gold and silver and they're not really productive assets. Uh, but all the others are like, uh, companies, right? Like they produce like products, they create revenue, they create um, they create uh, dividends for for their own, and those are productive assets in a way, right? Um, so I think for Bitcoin, I want to make that a productive asset. Um, make sure that you can do more with it than just hold it. Um, and to me, like even create an, an entire Bitcoin economy around that in the same way as you have companies that are building economies around their products and around their companies. Uh, I, wanna, I think Bitcoin has this opportunity. I think gold doesn't really have that opportunity. Silver doesn't have it. But Bitcoin actually has the opportunity to create a full-fledged economy on top of it, around it, to make that asset way more productive than what it is now. And that one trillion or one point three or four trillion dollars, whatever it is now, can be become way bigger than that. And so, I think with, I mean, there's obviously the debate whether like we need that to be on the on Bitcoin, the layer one itself. Uh, or whether that can be on other chains. Um, I'm kind of okay with that being on other chains, like on Bitcoin layer twos, but as long as they use the security that is there from Bitcoin, the main asset, right? I don't want to, I'm not kind of advocating for like trying to like make a bunch of changes to the Bitcoin protocol. Um, I think it's okay as it is. Uh, and even as it is, as it stands now, we can leverage the security that is there um, to kind of build on top and build an economy around Bitcoin which doesn't, doesn't necessarily kind of compete with the view of like leaving Bitcoin as it is. Um, that's how I look at it. Mm. I mean, another reason why there isn't much <clears throat> layer two activity on Bitcoin in the past was that it's kind of hard to develop on to Bitcoin. You mentioned already Taproot. Um, is that like necessary to even do these on a technical level to do these uh, second layer solutions? Or um, yeah, what what kind of technical solutions do you envision? Yeah, so technically, I think um, Taproot obviously helped. I mean, it was a change to the protocol that uh, allowed uh, a few more things when it comes to like efficiency of transactions, data storage, things like that, to make that that block space more productive. Like Bitcoin, ten minute blocks, approximately very limited space. Uh, so 
you have to be like quite ruthless in terms of what can go into the block and whatnot. And with technology, I think one of the, the most promising ones uh, or like the ZK technology uh, where people can actually, or like protocols can actually uh, push data and inscribe, put it on the on the Bitcoin chain um, very efficiently in a way, you know, uh, and use that security as long as the Bitcoin block is mine, like there's no way back in a way and kind of use that, um, use that security. Um, there's other kind of tech enhancements that are kind of like BitVM is very active at the moment. Uh, even BitVM2, I think um, they're making like proper strides in kind of uh, bringing that programmability to Bitcoin in a way without having to to change it. Um, but again, at the moment, like at least from my side, I'm mostly looking at the the layer twos. I, I'm not that closely looking at Bitcoin L1 uh, because of what we what we do is really the interoperability between the L2s itself. Um, and L2s can be pretty wide, you know. Like at the moment, there's a big discussion between you know, whether it's an actual layer two, whether it's a side chain uh, or not. To me, a Bitcoin layer two, and that's my definition, and I haven't heard many people have a similar definition as me. To me, any kind of blockchain that uses Bitcoin as a prominent asset in DeFi, I call a Bitcoin layer two. So it's a very wide definition. Um, Ethereum obviously uses BTC in a form like you have wrapped BTC. So technically you can call it a Bitcoin layer two in my definition, but even like chains like Base who now have Coinbase BTC, right? Um, with a lot of, of activity around CBBTC. You have Binance, uh, Binance chain who has, or they have uh, BTCB, right? To me, I can even call that a Bitcoin layer two because Bitcoin is an active form of, uh, of our, an active asset within their economy. And to me, it's more about the Bitcoin powered economy. And so I call BTC Fi, I actually call it Bitcoin powered decentralized finance. Um, so I see it a bit broader than, than many others see it. To me, it's not only the stuff that is built technically on top of Bitcoin. To me, it's the, the entire economy around Bitcoin, the asset. Uh, so that's how I look at things. That makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, it does. Um, I was wondering, could you give some examples for layer two solutions? You mentioned already some that get you really exciting. Um, yeah, yeah, really interesting. Absolutely. I mean, the, the ones I mentioned are mostly, I think, the ones that you didn't expect, um, right? So, so um, Ethereum, um, Base, or Binance are not the typical layer twos you would expect. The the more typical ones that that I think are very promising um, are protocols like Stacks, for example. I think Stacks is one of the earlier ones that has been building for quite a while. Um, and um, I mean, you have others that have come up uh, like BitLayer, uh, Merlin. You have Rootstock. Uh, you have BVM, you have Core. Um, all of these are, are like in the last, let's say, 12 months have grown quite massively in terms of uh, adoption, in terms of, of TVL, in terms of DeFi activity. There's a lot of promising one. There's actually 50 plus uh, Bitcoin layer twos that are live at the moment. Um, some of them more like more active than others. Um, some of them more successful than others. Some of them will probably not stay live for that long. Some of them might be even scams. I don't know. Um, but there's a lot of people who like who realize, look, Bitcoin layer twos is a thing. Um, there is actually demand for that, right? For people who want to use Bitcoin. And it all comes with different kind of security assumptions as well. Like each of these Bitcoin layer twos has their form of kind of using either Bitcoin security um, like on their chain in their, in their um, consensus mechanism or they use uh, some form of a bridge between uh, between the, the main chain and their chain to uh, to bridge the asset. Um, so there's different security assumptions between all of these, um, but it's a very like, how to say, growing ecosystem uh, in the last 12 years, uh, sorry, last 12 months, it's been growing like rapidly, um, yeah. Mm. And um, did I get it correct that persistence is not building a layer two, but rather connecting the ecosystem of layer two is that a yes. fair definition of what you do yes yes that's very correct so we're not building a layer two so we definitely don't, don't want to build a layer two um what we want to do is uh we want to make it easy for people to go from one layer two to another so i'll, I'll explain this in a bit more detail so each of these layer twos they have or not all of them but most of them have introduced their own form of BTC. So, and I mentioned uh, Merlin, they have Merlin BTC. Uh, when I mentioned, uh, let's say Stacks, they will have Stacks BTC. 
Um, when I mention, uh, let's say, Core, I think Core, they're using mostly um, RAP, or RAP BTC, WBTC. Um, so they work together with someone else to issue it natively on their chain. But so each of these chains, they have their native form of BTC, which is not strictly BTC, but it is typically one-to-one -one backed with BTC. And there's some form of a bridge uh, between uh, their network and the Bitcoin network so that you can redeem your original Bitcoin back for uh, for the, the pegged asset that you have, right? Um, but so what this creates is a very fragmented economy of Bitcoin that is in all of these different ecosystems. Um, but for users, it's very hard to, let's say you have Bitcoin in the form of Coinbase BTC on base, but now you see this DeFi opportunity on, let's say, Stacks. There's a new borrowing lending protocol on Stacks. And on Stacks, you can only like deploy Stacks BTC but now you want to go with your Coinbase BTC, it's obviously not accepted there. So you'll have to kind of un unwrap it from uh, from base uh, to whatever form it is to go back to BTC. Then from BTC, you have to go to Stacks. And that's just not efficient because it will take you at least half an hour. You have to have like three Bitcoin confirmations at least. So a um, bunch of fees, you'll you'll be like, you'll be bored by the time it, it actually arrives there. Plus all of the, all of the work you have to do to get it there. And so, what we think is that if you want DeFi to really grow uh, and you want this uh, ecosystem of Bitcoin layer twos to kind of grow in the pie together, you need them to be interoperable. So how we like or what we envisioned is where, look, I have whatever form of BTC I have on one chain, I want to go to another chain deployed at another protocol. I want to do that instantly. Right. And so that's what we solve for. And the. Uh, we make that possible through, um, it's an intent-based framework. And uh, I mean, I can go a bit deeper into intents as well, if you want. Um, but basically, how it works is, let's say you're the holder of one uh, Coinbase BTC on base. And you say, actually, now I want to get one Stacks BTC on Stacks. Right? That's your intent. That's your wish. And um, you broadcast that as like a, a signed transaction in a way where you say, look, this is what I want. I want to give up my Coinbase BTC and I want to get my Stacks BTC. How it happens, I don't care. I just want that one Stacks BTC to arrive in my wallet, um, and I give the permission to take the Coinbase BTC out of my wallet. Right? And um, so once you sign that intent, what we do as a protocol, we actually uh, bring together a bunch of what we call solvers. Um, it's an intent-based network. Solvers are typically market makers or uh, professional players that have access to uh, to liquidity, whether it is their own inventory or whether it's a pool of liquidity they can access somewhere. Um, and basically, they fill these requests. So let's say you have uh, Coinbase BTC, you want Stacks BTC, the solver or this market maker sees your request. And within a second, he actually sell. OK, I will sell you my uh, Stacks BTC and I'll send it to you immediately on, on the Stacks chain. You receive it, right? So you receive your uh, BTC on Stacks, you're happy. Um, and you have given the permission to withdraw that assets on the on the base ch base uh, chain um, to go to the market maker. So once our like our protocol verifies that you actually have received your BTC on the stack side, we will release the BTC on the on the base side uh, to uh, to the market maker, who then can or cannot that's up to him rebalance his inventory because he'll obviously have more inventory now on base, less inventory on stacks. But they are professionals um, in this. That is what they do anyway, market making, right? So. Um, they basically rebalance their inventory. Uh, they obviously take a small fee for that um, for that transaction. Um, but yeah, user happy within a second, market maker happy like once finality is reached. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of how it works. Sweet, thanks. Um, yeah, that's quite abstract. And um, I got maybe eighty percent, maybe our listeners less. And then maybe let's get more concrete. For me as a user. What can I do in five years? What kind of use cases do you envision, like tangible use cases for um, Bitcoin DeFi? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's a few, right? I think the main objective for people holding Bitcoin, I think, is to have more Bitcoin. <laughs> um, so you want to kind of generate, <laughs> so you want to generate yield on, on Bitcoin and yield can come from a few, like a few ways. Like typically you can either, lend out your bitcoin to someone else who will like pay an interest on that right um it's typical borrowing lending which you see in, in traditional finance as well so that's the first way to kind of make your bitcoin more efficient you earn you earn more more bitcoin um second option is 
kind of more um, also traditional finance, but slightly more complicated. You can sell like options on your Bitcoin, right? You can sell like covered call options, for example, um, make uh, make some money of that uh, if the options are in the money. Um, slightly more complicated, but again, it's a form of yield that you can generate on your Bitcoin. Now, with everything that's happening in DeFi, I'm not sure if, if uh, the viewers have heard of this protocol called Babylon. Um, Babylon actually has um, has launched Bitcoin staking now. So you can actually lock up your Bitcoin um, and that Bitcoin is then used specifically to secure other protocols, other chains, and they are paying some form of a rent for that. Like they're paying like security uh, fees in a way, uh, whether that's in Bitcoin or whether that's in other tokens. Um, so it's again, like it's a form of earning more Bitcoin, but it's a different way. So you have multiple versions now of like how you can earn more Bitcoin with the Bitcoin that you have. Um, so that's definitely like the main use case, I think that will start more and more innovation on DeFi. So once you have now these yield generating forms of Bitcoin, like whatever form it comes into, you can actually use that and let's say start and use it as collateral, right? So now you have that, you can now borrow against it. So instead of selling your Bitcoin to buy a house or buy a car or whatever you want to buy, now you don't have to sell anymore. You can actually, you have that Bitcoin that you deposit somewhere, it's generating yield. And in the meantime, you take a loan. So let's say you have $100,000 worth of Bitcoin, you borrow $10,000 worth of dollars to make your purchase of whatever you want to buy. Now, that Bitcoin is yield generating, right? So eventually the loan can pay off itself with the yield that it generates. So to me, those are like the use cases I envision in, in Bitcoin in a couple of years. It's like uh, self-repaying loans. Um, I'm thinking of in a way, leverage liquid staking, where you say, look, I'm happy with the 3% yield that I get on my Bitcoin. But if I actually take some leverage on this, I can actually go and loop this a few times. So you put in your Bitcoin, you borrow USD with that USD, you buy more Bitcoin, which you stake again, which again, you use to put in as collateral so you can borrow more. So it's like a loop, right? But you can you can do this three, four or five times, maybe. So your 3% becomes 10, 12, 15%. Right? So you can get 15% on your Bitcoin. And to answer your question, like in a very short form, um, look, if you I think it's just all about like the finance part of it, making your capital more efficient and earn more Bitcoin. I don't really foresee it as many others where you say, look, you'll, you'll use Bitcoin in like everyday life to pay for everything. I, I don't know. I think I'm quite realistic in that, um, that I, I'm not sure that will happen. To me, it's just an asset class and uh, an asset class that I think people want to see more efficient and want to have more yeah, more returns on it. That's how I look at it mostly. Yeah, not uh, needing to sell my Bitcoins and borrow against them definitely sounds exciting. It sounds also a bit like a pyramid scheme, but uh, yeah, well, we'll see. <laughs> Um, I well, was wondering. There's yeah. risk. <laughs> there's risk. <of> <laughs> if yeah. Bitcoin drops massively, then you'll, you might get liquidated but eventually like since everything in DeFi is quite automated it should be i mean it's at least it's correct right like if the if the value of your collateral drops in any world you would you would get like liquidated or you would have to repay the the loan right um so i think it's just a more efficient way and um yeah, whether you use leverage or not it's just like your choice of of risk and then risk appetite i would say yeah right um I can't really use that now, but like, um, do I need a special wallet to access BTC Fi or several wallets or how, how's that working? Um, I mean, yes, there are different, different, different wallets for, I mean, different purposes. The most, mostly the ones that are on Bitcoin network itself are, are there, but for what we do, um, you actually don't really need, need one of those. Uh, typically the, at least the chains that we started with are all EVM compatible. Um, which means they work with the typical wallets that you might use, like a, a MetaMask is typically the most common one. Um, but there, there's others as well. But um, no, no specific wallet actually need. We will work with pretty much any wallet that is accepted on any of the chains. Um, and um, I mean, currently in our solution, we don't have uh, the Bitcoin network itself uh, implemented uh, because there's, I mean, it's very hard to program on Bitcoin directly. Um, but so, um, yeah, no, no real specific wallet needed current than the other like EVM wallets typically that you, that you would know. Mm. Interesting. Um, you're making a bold claim that BTC Fi is going to 250 billion USD TVL next year. And to compare Ethereum right now has like 50 billion. 
that's um yeah several several times the amount so i was wondering what makes you so confident that bitcoin will surpass other chains in DeFi. Uh, if I can't remember if I said was it for the next year or in three years, I can't remember. Maybe it was three years, but um, either way, I think I mean it might be this. It might be next year, you know. Um, mm. But um, I mean, the main reason is is just mind share. Um, look, I think um, Bitcoin has mind share. Bitcoin has adoption. Um, if I talk about crypto in general um, to people who are not in the industry, they think crypto is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is crypto. Um, and even the second biggest asset like Ethereum or ETH, right? People don't know, they have no clue what it is and they mostly have no interest as well. So I think when it comes to like um, mass adoption, mind share, I think there's only Bitcoin at this stage, which which seems to, to really have that. Um, and previously the, the reason for people to look into other stuff was really that programmability issue, the scaling issue where Look, Bitcoin is not scalable to do all these DeFi things, right? Um, but now Bitcoin actually has that, right? Uh, or at least it's kind of in the works. It's growing rapidly. And I wouldn't be surprised that like in, uh, in a couple of months down the line, people will actually realize, well, everything we do elsewhere, everything we do on Ethereum, um, maybe Solana is different because it's very, very fast and it's like more more of a meme as well in a way, like the all the meme traders. Um, but a lot of the stuff you do in like in true DeFi on Ethereum, you can actually do on Bitcoin as well, or at least on a Bitcoin L2. Um, and you just have the asset that is behind it that is just so much more powerful. Like the, the current Bitcoin economy or the Bitcoin asset is $1.5 trillion. Um, and um, if you look at the, the DeFi, DeFi on Ethereum, I think relatively to the size of ETH, the asset, um, is um, is is relatively big, right? Uh, on on Bitcoin, it's like one percent. Right? It's one percent of of all, and uh, uh, Bitcoin is actively used in DeFi. And if you just even draw the parallel between um, if if ETH, or sorry, if Bitcoin DeFi becomes as big as relatively speaking as ETH DeFi, even then it's going to be five x the size or four x the size of uh, of, of ETH DeFi. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if it overtakes. And, and I think just the mind share of, of people and, and uh, um, yeah, the, the size of the asset to me makes that a, yeah, a, a pretty like simple prediction in a way. Like, I don't think that much needs to happen. I think it's, it's going to be so quick and especially, I mean, I'm, I'm not advocating here for TradFi coming into to Bitcoin or, uh, but with these ETFs, you can just see it, right? Like it's so, uh, it's so adopted now, and I think it's only going to get bigger with more corporates coming into BTC, uh, more countries even like uh, coming into into BTC, hold maybe some of their reserves into BTC, and the the size of the asset will, in my opinion, like continue to grow. Um, so yeah, no, yeah. that is actually a great segue into our second topic for today. Um, let's talk about a bit about Bitcoin institutional adoption and maybe. Um, price development in the last weeks and in the future um, and yeah I mean some Bitcoiners argue that BTC was built as a measure to defense um, against traditional finance and what you are doing BTC Fi is also yeah taking control out of centralized parties and now the case is that ETFs own about one percent of the circulating supply ETFs accumulated in total now a million BTC does that worry you? Not really. I think one percent is a very small amount still, um, and uh, I think most, like most importantly, like it doesn't mean that they can change Bitcoin, right? Um, it's uh, the network of like the the miners and then the nodes, like they keep the the Bitcoin chain running, like regardless of how much Bitcoin the institutions have. And in a way, I think we've had, I think fifty. It's coming up to sixteen years now since Bitcoin launched, where they were not participating, which gave ample time for um, for retail to kind of come in, shape it the way they wanted to do, take their positions, uh, kind of bet on these things. And in a way, I think now seeing TradFi coming in and taking huge positions is type, I mean, it's kind of natural to me. I think they see a, an asset that kind of has gained adoption where they like it has gained legitimacy as well uh, as, as a like a real asset, right? Um, so to me, it's actually, yeah, it's a good thing that they come in. Uh, would I want to see them hold 100% of Bitcoin? 
Probably not. But if, even if they would, um, that would mean that a lot. Of, I think a lot of people would have gotten rich in the process uh, because prices would uh, would have gone up um, quite a bit. And and eventually, I think it's it's open. It's fair for everyone to join. So I think it would be wrong to say, well, you're fat fight, you can't join, you can't buy Bitcoin. Um, I think it gains adoption, it gains like mainstream uh, mainstream adoption. And to me, it's a good thing. Uh, whether there's a limit, I, I don't know. <laughs> we'll, we'll see, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Yeah, it would be interesting to see where there's like a cap uh, right now. ETF issuers accumulate like many times the amount of Bitcoin that is produced a day. That's quite impressive. and. Um, I I was wondering, it seems a bit like a chicken and egg problem. I do not really get what comes first. The price goes up and then the ETF demand goes up or vice versa. Do you have any opinion on that? <laughs> that's that's tricky to say. I, I, I don't know. I mean, um, it's maybe a bit of both. Maybe it's like this, um, how do you call it? A flywheel effect, you know, like they see mm. price, price go up and then oh, yeah, people want to buy more because they see, oh yeah, it actually is going up it's like fomo like if i don't buy now it will continue to go up and then obviously more comes in and like price goes up again like um but i i know very hard to say like with this size of an asset like what exactly causes the the price movements if you don't like i'm i'm not monitoring that super closely to be honest like these these etf inflows uh, outflows um but yeah, overall i think it's it's uh, bullish and kind of making things go up um, if there is more more demand on the etf side mm. Yeah, I was wondering what the next narrative is in Bitcoin. Like at first it was like the institutions are coming and then the nation states are coming. Now the institutions are here, ETFs uh, accumulating all the Bitcoins. It sort of seems that the Bitcoin narrative simply won and we can all like uh, retire sort of. Uh, would you agree or what's, what's sort of the next goal in Bitcoin? What's the next narrative do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it's what we discussed, right? It's BTC, DeFi, or BTC Fi in a way. Um, I, I think we have, I think we're far from done. I think we're only like just starting now. Like, in a way, I would like to see a lot more of the world economy run on top of Bitcoin. Uh, I want to, like, I mean, I'm not a big fan of banks in general. Um, not saying Bitcoin can overtake all banks like, uh, like instantly, but over time, we'd like to just see more and more financial services uh, around the world kind of. Be built on top of Bitcoin because that has that security layer, that decentralized aspect into it, um, where you don't have to be scared in a way like, well, tomorrow the government can decide to close down my bank or my bank account, or tomorrow my actually bank can just tell me that I've never been a customer and um, <laughs> like I don't know what happens to my money, right? I think with Bitcoin you have that security um, that at least like your keys, you you hold it and um, Yeah, I think I still want to see a lot more of that, obviously. Um, and um, then, yeah, the growth of, of DeFi on top of, of Bitcoin and, and then especially like the yield generating aspect of it, like where it actually becomes that productive and there's actually activity on the on the different chains that support uh, fees and, and things like that so that um, it actually becomes yeah an asset that generates money, more money in a way, right? Um, and Yeah, makes it more efficient. So for me, it's still a long way to go. I think we're still very early. Um, if you look at like even DeFi when it started on Ethereum and where it is now, they, they've gone a very long way in terms of like what's possible, what's secure, things like that. Bitcoin is just starting that journey in a way. And obviously there's a lot of learnings from the Ethereum side and from other chains that can be taken into account so that it won't take that long. Um, but yeah, I think it's still very early actually. And then I think people will continue to look for more and better better ways to make that asset more yeah more productive yeah in that case it's maybe even better that bitcoin is uh for now not the first mover and can learn from ethereum Absolutely. and you definitely got me very excited about btc fi and uh thank you so much for for everything you're doing for for btc fi and bitcoin and also thanks for joining us today at btc echo experts um yeah And I mean, our listeners can always reach us at podcast at btc-echo.de and maybe um, state where listeners can reach you, Jerome. Yeah, absolutely. I think the easiest way to keep track is on uh, on Twitter or like X now. I keep on mistakenly saying Twitter, uh, but it's a uh, handle is persistence1. Um, so um, that's relatively easy. Or the website is persistence.1 and you'll find all of the links there as well. We have 
very active communities on uh, on Telegram, on Discord, um, and uh, obviously on yeah on X. We're we're quite present as well. We post uh, on everything that we're working on, and um, yeah, we, we have some interesting updates coming coming soon. We have our testnet going live very soon. Uh, mainnet shortly after. Uh, we've announced a lot of integrations with with some partners with different L2s. Um, so yeah, stay tuned. Um, and uh, yeah, let's uh, let's work on BTC fight together. And thank you so much for having me. It was a, it was a pleasure. Sweet. Thanks. Have a great day and talk to you soon. Bye bye. Thank you.